Steve. Thank you, David. I'm going to talk to you about the disadvantage of being the speaker right before the break. <laughs> 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 um, I, I, I'm really pleased to be here, and I want to congratulate both you and George on uh, taking the helm of this roundtable and wish you the best of luck on what is certainly <laughs> It's, it's a great endeavor. I mean, listening to the presentations this morning, uh, I think, maps out uh, the challenge, but also the opportunity. And I, I, I think all of us in the field are behind you in terms of wishing you success. Um, Alina asked me to uh, talk some about uh, the report that we recently re released on the U.S. health disadvantage. Apologies in advance, because I'm going to fly through that uh, with a lot of slides real fast, um, because I want to reserve some time for stepping back and offering some reflections about what it all means for the roundtable. But I did want to give you some familiarity with th that report and then try to fold it into uh, this larger conversation. So this is a report that was sponsored by the Institute of Medicine and the National Research Council uh, to look at how the health of the American uh, population compares with uh, a set of peer countries that we identified that are also high income countries shown on the map. Um, and th it's been well known for some years that we don't do as well as other countries. This is the famous uh, kind of slide that uh, you often see, Martha, I used it again, uh, from uh, our prior IOM committee's report showing uh, healthcare spending as a percentage of GDP um, for us and the other countries. The red circle over on the far right, as you know, is our, uh, our country. And uh, the, the point that's typically made here is we don't get good value for our dollar, and Eduardo and others uh, made this point. Um, what, uh, what we focused on, though, was the fact that uh, not only is our life expectancy lower than these other countries, but uh, is our health in other dimensions also different uh, than in those other countries. And to try to just fly through this with you really quickly to orient you to these bar charts, the red is the United States. So if you divide mortality into three large buckets, uh, non-communicable diseases and communicable diseases and injuries, you'll see the U.S. ranks uh, at or near the bottom uh, on multiple measures of mortality uh, in comparison to these peer countries. The table on the left shows cause-specific mortality rates. Uh, the United States, uh, all, all the conditions in the upper part of the slide uh, are diseases where U.S. mortality rates exceed those of peer countries. The smaller list at the bottom are the diseases where uh, the U.S. is doing comparable to other countries or, or better, cancer uh, being the notable example there. But the fact that you, you, without even being able to read the font, that there's so many more up here shows you that on multiple conditions that are quite varied in nature, the U.S. is doing worse. In terms of life expectancy, the U.S. is the shaded value at the bottom, and uh, as has been widely noted, the U.S. Uh, uh, life expectancy is lower than, than other peer countries. Perhaps the more disturbing uh, notion is how this is changing over time. It's a problem that's been getting progressively worse for decades. Um, it, to orient you to these slides, the red dots are the U.S., the gray dots are uh, other countries. And what you can see here, this is life expectancy at birth for males, this is life expectancy at birth for females. Back in 1980, we were, for males, sort of in the middle of the distribution and then have progressively moved to the bottom. Uh, same for females, but look at this. This is the probability of reaching age 50. Uh, males uh, at the bottom of the rank and uh, dropping to, the, to uh, the lowest ranking, but look at females, completely off the charts. Um, clearly, uh, Americans are at a pronounced disadvantage, not only in terms of newborn life expectancy, but even to uh, trying to reach age 50. And it was really trying to understand what's going on in this younger age group that was the genesis for forming our panel to try to de deconstruct uh, what is going on there. My slide is not advancing. Thank you. This is uh, an alarming uh, graph that uh, we produced in our report showing life expectancy across the age spectrum, uh, ranking the U.S. relative to the other countries. And what you basically see here is that beginning at birth, uh, all the way through till about age 75, life expectancy in the U.S. is always the lowest or near the lowest. It's not until you reach age 75 that U.S. life expectancy starts uh, having a, some kind of advantage. So this is not a problem that the, the fact that people aren't living to age 50 in the United States as, as readily as in other countries is not a problem that you could blame on diabetes or other diseases that are occurring in middle age. It's occurring beginning 
uh, with uh, childhood and with the, actually the first moments of life, as we'll uh, uh, show. Um, David uh, just gave us a, a very powerful dis discussion of the role of disparities and the, the fact that health disparities in the United States are so well documented might lead some to wonder whether this low ranking in the U.S. compared to other countries is simply a reflection of the very severe health problems that exist among minorities or the poor um, and that uh, those who are more advantaged are potentially doing, uh, doing just fine compared to the other high income countries. So we did this calculation showing the same graph you saw before, but this time only for non-Hispanic whites. And you still see the same pattern uh, across age groups. Uh, the U.S. non-Hispanic white is uh, going to live a shorter life on average than uh, comparable folks in other countries. And a, a finding that we repeatedly saw in our report, looking at college-educated Americans, high-income Americans, even Americans with healthy behaviors, uh, have worse health outcomes than their peers in other countries. Which, I, I, in the discussion, I'd like to sort of follow on David's question, uh, because he was asking, why, how could it be that uh, minorities with uh, a college education are, are doing worse uh, than, than uh, 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 whites with a college education? It must be something related to racism, but part of what we're seeing here is that even among the so-called advantaged Americans, we're doing worse than advantaged, America, uh, advantaged folks in other high-income countries. So I think there's something even more systemic that's going on. In terms of the determinants of health, modifiable risk factors that affect health, the pattern is the same. Uh, America leads the world in uh, BMI and obesity. Uh, so you see the red bars at the broad bottom for various age groups. Um, if we look at diabetes, a condition uh, that uh, is very much uh, related to obesity as a risk factor, you see the same pattern, of course. Uh, as I mentioned, this disadvantage starts at the beginning of life. So it's, it's pretty well known that infant mortality rates in the United States are higher than in other countries. I don't think people realize how much higher they are. But look at this in particular, which is quite disturbing, is how long this problem has been going on. The gray line is infant mortality rates in peer countries uh, in the OECD. The, the red line is the U.S. So they, they outpaced us long ago. Um, and we continue to have higher uh, infant mortality rates. Uh, other birth outcomes, the same story. Uh, the second highest uh, rate of low birth rates. Uh, Preterm births, our rate is comparable to sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, on a variety of measures, it's not just birth outcomes, on a variety of measures related to uh, children's health, uh, American children are less likely to reach age five uh, than children in other high-income countries. Uh, higher rates of, of deaths, uh, higher rates of injuries, multiple organizations like the OECD and UNICEF have ranked the U.S. lowest among the high-income countries in terms of children's health. Adolescents, an age group that got a lot of attention from us because we saw some very disturbing patterns among, among American teens compared to teens in other countries. Uh, not surprising, given all the other evidence you've seen, the highest rates of obesity and diabetes I don't know where I'm supposed to be pointing this to make it work, but uh, thank you. Uh, but uh, say something like teen pregnancy. Uh, the U.S. Uh, leads high-income countries in terms of teen pregnancies uh, and highest rates of STDs among teens, highest rates of HIV infection among teens among high-income countries. Injury mortality, again, you might not be surprised to hear that we have the highest injury mortality rates both from unintentional injuries like car accidents um, and from intentional injuries as I'll mention in a minute. But did you realize this was true back in the 1950s? This is a, a temporal chart showing how many decades this has been the pattern. It's a long-standing part of our American lifestyle that our kids are more likely to die in car accidents and, uh, and through violence. Uh, this here showing the same uh, type of graph uh, showing death rates from violence among uh, the younger age group compared to our peer countries. A huge uh, discrepancy uh, that's very much on our minds these days. The population age 50 and older is uh, a population that's been very well studied in cross-national comparisons and it's very well documented in the literature that Americans have a much higher prevalence of various chronic diseases. The list is shown there on the right, it's a long list. Uh, compared to people in England and Europe uh, of the same age and even of the same risk factors, uh, the U.S. tends to do worse. Here's the problem our panel encountered. When we tr 
tried to sum all this up. Uh, what are the various health problems where the U.S. seems to be doing worse than other countries? They tended to fall into these nine buckets. But if you were asked to identify a cause for all of this, uh, you'd realize you're, these are very diverse conditions. Uh, so it'd be sort of easy if we could blame it all on obesity um, or guns uh, or, or some other single risk factor. But this is a very a broad spectrum of conditions. Nonetheless, we tried to take a systematic approach uh, to thinking about what might be causing this. Could you advance to the next slide, please? Um, we looked at uh, the role of the health system. We looked at individual behaviors. We looked at the environment. We looked at social factors. Um, what you see there is a list of some of the problems we identified. But the thing I'd want to point out to you is what, what was really stunning to us is in each of these categories that we looked at and we co systematically compared the U.S with other countries, we saw the same pattern of the U.S. falling behind other countries uh, in terms of uh, our performance and, th and that the gap has increased over time. So whether you're talking about child poverty, where we've had the highest child poverty rates um, in, uh, in the U.S. compared to other countries since 1980, so in, in terms of social economic factors, the lowest rates of social mobility, uh, American kids who are poor are least likely to climb the economic ladder compared to uh, kids in other countries. Flip over to a different category like individual behaviors, we find higher rates of unhealthy behaviors such as not only unhealthy diet but uh, Ill Ill illicit drug use, uh, uh, unsafe sex, uh, injurious behaviors, uh, and of course uh, civilian firearm possession, and uh, the health system, uh, are notorious differences between the uh, infrastructure of our healthcare system and other countries. I could go on, and we don't have enough time for me to go into detail. The point is, we're not only losing ground in terms of health relative to other countries, we found that we're losing ground, uh, ground to other countries on a variety of measures other than aggregate wealth. Uh, the U.S. economy is very large. Uh, but in terms of all other uh, measures, major measures of social and economic well-being, we're falling behind the other countries. So it's not only a, a, a an issue for con public health concern, but one that I think should uh, concern us more broadly as a country. We looked upstream to try to think about the policies and social values that shape these conditions. This might be perhaps the one magic bullet that could explain such a diverse set of health problems is uh, our, our approach to how we go about making decisions in this country. Time doesn't permit me to go into detail on this, but we examine such things as the relatively small amount of uh, our resources that we devote to social spending. That's what that red bar reflects. Uh, we were very intrigued by the study by Elizabeth Bradley and her colleagues at Yale, uh, which uh, plotted the ratio between social spending and health care spending. And you can see this is the U.S. over here, the outlier, and then this is the rest of the high-income countries over here that spend proportionally much more on social programs than on health care. Um, and so these are the countries that have the better health outcomes are the ones that are spending more of their health dollars on uh, social programs uh, that address some of these larger environmental contributors to health. Okay, our recommendations. Uh, I don't know, did I skip over a slide there? No, I guess not. Okay, well, uh, what I just skipped over uh, is all of our research recommendations, um, <laughs> which is probably not the right thing to do at the Institute of Medicine. But uh, uh, we had a whole chapter, and that was actually our, our statement of task was to focus on research recommendations. Um, so we had lots of details in there, if you're interested, on uh, recommendations for data harmonization, uh, new efforts at data collection, innovative study designs, and uh, changes in how we go about uh, supporting uh, f the, the research uh, agenda around this topic, because more data are needed. Um, but our panel was really uh, very uh, disturbed by the findings and felt that we should not wait for more research before taking action. So we had a set of policy recommendations, the first of which was a bit of a no-brainer, which is that we really need to get serious about addressing national health objectives, that all of those nine conditions I showed you have been the subject of blue ribbon panels with evidence-based recommendations on what we need to do about it. So we already know what to do uh, in many cases. We don't need more research. Um, it's more a matter of marshalling the resolve and resources to do it. Um, and that's, that led to the next recommendation. Um, can you advance to the next slide? Uh, which was to launch a, a campaign, which I'm going to come back to in my remarks about the roundtable, to try to alert the American public to this problem, uh, because we sense that Amer Americans are generally unaware of this issue, but also to stimulate a national discussion about what we're prepared to do about it. And I see a thread between the presentations this morning about 
Um, the need for building uh, buy-in and political will uh, for action. That, that's a theme that I've noticed in, in the talks this morning. And I think it's a message to the round table about where we really need to move. We, we sort of know what to do. I'll come back to that in a second. And then finally, we recommended uh, studying what other countries' uh, approaches have been that they have found successful in achieving their better health outcomes to see whether there's any lessons that could be learned or adapted for use in the US. So with that, uh, let me just change gears and uh, step back and think about uh, what uh, advice I would have for the roundtable after going through this exercise and just thinking more broadly about it's nice that uh, Alina gave me the invitation to think about something beside our panel's report. It's refreshing. Um, and I, th I have six uh, suggestions, uh, one of which is that we really need to do a better job of clarifying what we mean by population health and fixing what I think uh, is, is an increasing misuse of the term in the health policy community. Uh, I, I refer you to this recent commentary in JAMA talking about accountable care organizations and their mandate to improve population health and how their notion of what accountable uh, population health means is not, I think, what everyone in this room would probably uh, think of. It's mo they're, they're thinking more in terms of their patient population, uh, the, uh, the clients served by their organization, um, their health care delivery system, and not the health of their community. Um, and trying to move the, the uh, the uh, zeitgeist about what population health means is, I think, an important goal for the roundtable to start with. Uh, second one is to, to give the folks who, who, there's this gravitational pull in our country around health care. The, the conversation is, is immediately drawn to health care. And I often show this slide because I know it's hard to read in the back of the room. So the goal is not for you to actually have it legible. This is the WHO uh, model of the determinants of health. But to simply tell, I often do this talk with uh, my doctors and other colleagues in, in, in hospitals and healthcare settings, tell them this is where they work. This is the health system over here. Um, and, and yeah, it does have some impact on health. But to, to give some humility to those of us who grew up in the healthcare world as to what are the larger forces driving our health outcomes. And if we're really serious about improving population health, how can we possibly think that the strategy is to pour all of our resources into that little box, but that is in effect what we're doing. <clears throat> so giving, uh, changing the dialogue so uh, it's uh, put in context. Um, I, I think I do have to say more research is needed because more research is needed. Um, the the uh, idea that was mentioned earlier of uh, having a Dartmouth atlas for uh, public health, I think, or for population health, I think is a, a fabulous idea. Uh, the committee that many of us uh, served on before with the IOM identified all the challenges with that. Uh, there, we don't have the, the raw data sources that we need uh, to actually do that correctly, and an investment needs to be made by our society in pulling together that kind of information so that we have that kind of intelligence about how we're doing. Uh, there is an opportunity through machine learning, big data sets, and so forth. There's another recent JAMA commentary that I might mention. Uh, to, to get really interesting new insights. And, and in our recent report on the U.S. health disadvantage, we outline lots of interesting uh, unknowns that we need to solve through uh, more science. So I'm a researcher. We're at the Institute of Medicine. Of course, we need to do more research. But uh, we already know what we need to do uh, to, to start addressing these problems. And so I hope that the Population Roundtable will do more than recycle uh, existing knowledge and even the charge from Dr. Feinberg to do some demonstration projects uh, or identify some, some uh, isolated interesting examples is a good step forward, but I would hope that uh, it might be possible to take on a bolder task, which is to change the national discussion and to actually, uh, for the round table, to actually launch a new movement you know, in our country to, to uh, get more serious about improving health. Um, the uh, policymakers who are leading our country, who are very much drawn by this gravitational pull, uh, are very concerned about the rising cost of health care and, and bending the cost curve, but uh, are, are very much influenced by this mentality that the answer lies in health care interventions. Um, it's a theme that Eduardo and others have already noted. I think one of the big contributions the roundtable can make is to help these folks, both at the national and state and local level, start connecting the dots between 
policy decisions that they think of as not being health related um, and to understand that they not only matter to health, but they are the answer uh, to uh, improving health and controlling costs. So they are, they, uh, their, their notions about education reform, economic development, jobs, so forth, those belong to some other committee than the, the health care committees. Um, and uh, that's because we have this silo mentality that tends to think of those as not related to the health sector. The health and all policies movement uh, has really uh, focused on this need to raise awareness about the relevance of these conditions outside of health, but we really need to, to have a much more robust effort to move that conversation forward uh, to, to get policymakers to not only pat you on the head and say, well, of course I understand that land use and zoning and all those things have some health implications, but to understand that's the answer. Uh, we're, not going, we're not going to solve the problem by pouring more money into the health care system um, because uh, if, if that were the case, the U.S. health disadvantage uh, that I showed you earlier would not exist and it would not be growing worse. Uh, we've already tried the model of pouring more money into health care than uh, uh, the other sectors and we've seen the results. Um, I think a really exciting challenge for the roundtable is not so much around doing more research uh, or even uh, talking to ourselves uh, in the public health community about some really cool communities that have done some exciting work. That's been done and we should continue to, to uh, 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 pr praise those efforts, but is to bring in the stakeholders who are really going to change things in this country. Um, and who are those people? Well, uh, I'd like to think it's our elected officials, but uh, I guess I'm old enough now to have lost faith in that. Um, I think where we are now, though, is, is getting the business community uh, to align forces and begin to think about the, the advantage to them. Uh, and then I think the general public is our other constituency to reach out to. I'll get to them in a minute. But just in terms of the business community, I, I think I could have gotten up here 25 years ago and said that uh, it's important for us to um, address these various factors, but the, the business community or the, the industries that profit from the status quo are going to oppose taking resources out of health care and putting them into these social programs. Um, and that our, our elected officials are going to oppose the idea of investing heavily in these kinds of social and public health programs. What's different now, though, and I don't think I'm being overly naive, is that I think there is a growing um, movement uh, in industry among major corporate employers and business leaders in recognizing that they're losing their shirts because of the growing cost of health care and are beginning to understand, like Dow Chemical and the other examples, that there is uh, a ROI in investing uh, in these root causes of disease. It's going to increase workforce productivity. It's going to decrease their health care costs. Um, they're going to get uh, better quality employees for their, for their companies. Um, if they have a healthier community to draw, draw those workers from and a healthier population with, with uh, more modest health care bills. Um, so in a sense, we're reaching a point where there is competing business interests, the interests of perhaps uh, the health care industry in promoting the status quo, which they profit from, and the, health, and the uh, business interest of the rest of corporate America, which is getting killed by the system. And can we find a way to have a dialogue uh, within the business community about how to, fi how to find a win-win here uh, that helps uh, improve the bottom line and improve population health uh, in a way that, that interests them. And if they come along, I think the elected officials uh, whose campaigns are financed by them will come along as well. So I think part of uh, the, the bold opportunity for the roundtable is to change the discussion in our country uh, to, to around improving population health partly by making this business case, but I really liked what Eduardo said about if uh, you, you uh, establish the, the business case with, I'm, I'm ruining it, uh, what you said, Eduardo, but if you establish the business case, uh, all you've done is establish the business case. Uh, you said it in a more artful way. Um, and, and so I come from the 60s, so I'd like to think that there are uh, more potent arguments behind why we should be addressing uh, population health. Um, but, you know, when I, th when I sit here this morning thinking about this and wonder, well, what, what can we, we, t we t how, do we how do we generate political will? Why are we wringing our hands about our ability to generate political will? It's not like our agenda is saving national parks. Uh, we're talking about saving our lives. 
what, what better, what more motivating uh, issue could there be for the American public than saying, if we don't fix this, you're going to die earlier uh, and you're going to be sicker during your life. Uh, using the data from our report, we can confidently say that your children, my children, are going to live a shorter life because they were born in this country instead of Canada or in Europe. Uh, those kinds of reframing of the, of the storyline seems to me uh, have a way of pulling on heartstrings and reaching people and connecting peop with people in a way that we perhaps haven't done before. And if the roundtable can be effective in trying to engage the public around this crisis, uh, then perhaps that will uh, bring the political will to move forward. Uh, my final point, though, is that we are ill-equipped to change conversations because we're not good at that kind of thing. Uh, people in public health are not masters in communications or advertising or marketing. But a field that I see emerging is the partnership between the two. So, George, I don't know if you're still here, but I wanted to do a, a little plug for the California Endowment. This is uh, the side of the Moscone Center where APHA was in San Francisco last fall, where uh, there are these huge multi-story banners showing the zip code for kids uh, who, who uh, have different life expectancies, and the tagline was something like, it shouldn't matter where, where you were born uh, to you know, how long you live. Um, that's coming about through a partnership between the California Endowment and a very uh, skilled communications firm and larger efforts, George could say more accurately. Those kinds of collaborations, over on the right is the Health Communication Research Laboratory at Washington University, where you have people who understand public health but also understand communication and advertising beginning to work together to think about how do we use modern social media, modern, uh, the modern age of, of communication with our society to reach people around these issues in more effective ways. That I see as the challenge, not publishing more papers in the American Journal of Public Health. Um, I think we need to, to uh, move into this domain. If the roundtable can lead us there, it would be a great contribution. Thank you. Well, thanks. That's a great challenge, as have all the presentations that we've heard this morning. And um, we will, and so I want to thank uh, all the speakers um, for adding to this. We will take a 10-minute break, and then we're going to come back, and we'll bring the speakers up here, and we'll have a chance to interact with them in this public forum um, for the rest of the morning. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>